All right, hello everybody. Welcome again to our virtual rounds. Uh, I'm Angel, nurse practitioner here in New Jersey, the provider network officer with REACT 19. Um, I just wanna get us started. We're getting started a little bit late tonight, having some technical difficulties, but, but we're all here. And uh, we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Mobin Sayed as our speaker this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Bean, for coming on. Appreciate you it. You are very welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, quickly, I want to go over um, our, our mission statement, as we always do. Um, our mission is to bring healing to the moms, dads, friends, and loved ones who are facing life-altering side effects from their COVID-19 vaccination. We build bridges between patients and research institutions in order to develop better understanding of our vaccine complications. REACT 19 is science-based nonprofit offering financial, physical, and emotional support to those suffering from long-term COVID-19 vaccine adverse events globally. And as I said, we have Dr. Um, just admit, uh, Dr. Bean is here with us this evening. Um, not that he needs an introduction, but I'm going to. Uh, he's a physician. He graduated from uh, King Edward Medical University in 1994. After practicing clinical medicine for a few years, he continued his studies in computer science with the goal of merging innovative technologies and healthcare. Dr. Mobin's dedication for teaching began at Horizon Medical Institute. Dr. Mobin's unique skill set as a physician and software engineer enabled him to innovate. An artist, I must add, I have to say, your artwork is <laughs> quite wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> enabled him to innovate several products, including a portable 3D ultrasound system designed by Meditech RI. His experience as a high-tech executive includes time at Staples, Kohl's, Rulala, Jimvara, TJX, and most recently, uh, e-commerce giant PayPal. Dr. Mobin's dedication to innovative <clears throat> and pioneer medical education has been a mainstay in his life. At Dr. Bean Corp, Court. He strives to create a managed marketplace for medical providers that enables them to learn medicine in conjunction with new technology. And with that, I'm going to hand things over to you, Dr. B. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me. And thank you very much for everyone who is here and who would listen to this later on. Uh, Denise, I see your uh, message as well. Denise Hertz, MD, injured physician. There is just so much pain and suffering going on. So let's start our discussion. The basic idea, intermittent fasting and the benefit of it for immune system improvement, regeneration, and to take out the trash from the cells. So that is a basic concept. And behind that, the, the science started somewhere in 1950s and 60s it became a little more accelerated in 2016 with the Nobel Prize for, the, um, for finding the genes and the proteins for intermittent fasting uh, in 2016. Since then, there are thousands of studies per year for intermittent fasting and for autophagy. So it's a huge science, and I think it's a very important science as well. Um, I would say that science is now figuring out the mechanisms and the benefits. And as many people point out on my channel that various cultures, religions, belief systems had fasting in them for a long time. So good that science can figure out how these mechanisms work. My focus for today is gonna to be specifically triggering autophagy with intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting has a tons of benefits, but this is a very specialized discussion for autophagy. So with this, if you're okay, I'm going to share my screen and go from various, uh, various presentations I have done in the past. So this cartoon has been asked to be on the shirts a lot. So here is a cell and it is asking for the food and there is this little thing, don't feed the cells. So let's see. The first question that we want to answer is how does intermittent fasting actually help with the trash? So even before that, uh, I'm so sorry, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Even before that, let's, let's 
ground ourselves to this that why would a cell have trash in it, garbage in it? Or why would a cell that is damaged or senescent continue to live on? Why do we want the cells and the proteins in them to be recycled? That's the first question to answer. So here is the answer. Imagine our immune system is active. Imagine somebody gets SARS-CoV-2, COVID. As we are seeing the spike protein or the nucleocapsid protein, N protein, can actually turn on the apoptosis mechanism of a cell. What does that mean? When a cell gets infected, our body has no mechanism to remove the offending agent from within the cell. This is like a thief that had entered a house, house being a cell. Our body has no way of going into that house and removing the thief. So what does our body do? Our body would just demolish the whole cell itself. In that process, the first responsibility is on the cell itself. The cell has to say, you know what? I am under stress, so I should just die. That is called apoptosis. The spike protein, for example, or the N protein, for example, studies have shown this now again and again, they can turn off the apopto apoptotic pathways within a cell. That means SARS-CoV-2 can enter a cell and then stop that cell from dying so that it can continue to make new daughters inside that cell. So this is an example of a cell that is surviving beyond the reason to survive. It should not survive. It should die. Second, imagine uh, Dr. Bruce Patterson's work, S1 protein hanging out in the, in the monocytes. Now, monocytes' normal age or lifespan is four or five days until they become converted to a macrophage, then they can live for a longer time. But if a monocyte is irritated, if there is some trash hanging out in the cell, then the cell itself can turn off its own apoptotic signals to say, you know what, I should not die. I have some proteins in me that are bothersome. I, that means I need to continue to fight. So, of course, this doesn't happen with every cell. It is mostly with the immune cells that they would like to continue to fight. And so, uh, Dr. Patterson's group has been discussing this. I have been part of those discussions as well. What may be the reason that monocytes just keep on hanging on to that trash? It is possible that monocytes are actually recycling, but every time a cell recycles, another cell mostly macrophages or the monocytes, have to eat it up to recycle it. So maybe there is trash in a cell, which then is transferred to the next cell and then to the next cell as the younger cells continue to eat the older cells. Maybe it is that. Maybe it is the turning off of the apoptosis and the single cell lives on for a long time. Maybe there is some other third reason. What we know is there is trash sitting in the cell. So now we are looking at two problems. Cell is not dying when it should. And secondly, there is something hanging in the cell that should not be there. Now, many cells have waste products lying around in them. The things that we are calling trash. These extra proteins could be in following forms. I mean, think about it for a second with me. Imagine you have gone in the cell with me and cell is a little world and we are seeing things around. Cells have various uh, structures in them. For example, they have a nucleus in them. They have ribosomes in them. They have Golgi operators, uh, reticulums and so on it is possible that some parts of the cell, legitimate parts of the cell, overgrow. Similar to 
let's say a human being is taller and bigger than others, for example. So similarly, within the cell, there can be structures that are bigger because they just keep growing. Or in the cytoplasm of the cell, there can be debris sitting there. Debris is just other proteins. And I'm going to share my screen now. I can draw a little here and there. Am I sharing the correct? Do you see my whiteboard? Let me actually go back to the correct one. One second, please. I have to go to screen one, this one. <clears throat> so within these cells, if I draw a quick cell here, within the cell, there are the vesicles and the structures that could be overgrown. Then there can be trash sitting around within the cell cytoplasm. Then, this is a very important part now, we can make small, let's call them trash cans. They are called phagosomes. These are called phago. Phago means eating. Phagosome. Some is like a rounded thing. These little structures have eaten up some of the trash. So think of them as a trash can, trash bag, or a trash truck. Now, within this cell, this trash needs to be eaten out or swept away or taken away, digested away. These extra bulky structures need to be leaned up. We make them less bulky. This trash sitting in this phagosome needs to be removed. So how do we do that? <clears throat> what happens is, and excuse me for my cough, what happens is that within the cells, there are more vesicles. Vesicles are simply pockets uh, within the cell, small packaged material. There are some vesicles that are called lysosomes. They are called lysosome because they do lysis. Lysis means to break down something. These vesicles have, you can think of them as a stomach of the cell. These have enzymes in acids in them and enzymes in them that can break down almost everything. Just like our stomach can break down protein or fat or carbs or whatever. Similarly, these tiny microscopic stomachs can digest DNAs and RNAs and proteins and fats and whatever you put in front of them. So normally these lysosome, these will connect with phagosome, making a phagolysosome and then the acids and the enzymes would go into the phagosome from the lysosome, attack the digest the, the trash in there and eat it up and, and recycle that material to use for something else. These are normal processes. Now, one more thing before we continue and before you th think about intermittent fasting and read or watch or or research more. Our cells have two main mechanisms to break down or recycle cell components. One mechanism is called ubiquitin mechanism. And the other one is called lytic mechanism. In the ubiquitin mechanism, what happens is Imagine here is a protein. This protein was created to do some function in this cell. Our cells are great at building <laughs> and, te and tearing down. So what happens is when we build something, let's say this protein, when it has done its function, we need to tear it down. We need to destroy it. We need to recycle it. So what happens is we connect proteins with it, which are called ubiquitins that would create another pathway which is called caspases pathway and this protein would be digested away. The ubiquitin mechanism does not remove trash or does not remove all trash. It only removes selected targeted proteins that it is aware of that are formed when cell is functioning. So this is like if we are cooking at home 
we know that in the kitchen we'll have some vegetables, skin, and we'll have other such things, and we know how to remove them. However, if something falls in our house from the sky, then we have no idea what to do with it. So that is the problem with ubiquitin. In that case, the other recycling method works, and that is lytic system. Lytic system is what we say autophagy. This system operates very different from ubiquitin. This system, autophagy system, can pick up any kind of trash, any kind of extra material inside the cell, and it can recycle it. So now we have the basic ideas of what to look for when we are discussing the intermittent fasting. So let's start. This one quick discussion, intermittent fasting with immune systems impact. So imagine here is a cell, immune system cell. As you can see, it is all beat up. The reason for it is beat up is that it is fighting. Maybe there's a virus or a bacteria or a fungus or some injury. And this cell is fighting. And because it is fighting, it cannot do apoptosis. It's going to continue to live. And that is a problem. An immune cell that continues to live and that needs to recycle will continue to produce inflammatory markers and cause inflammation. Intermittent fasting actually recycles these cells. It triggers them through the lytic process to say, you know what, it's okay, you can die. Similarly, it induces regeneration, and I'll explain how a little later. So that is one. And this happens especially for the immune system cells because immune system cells are always getting produced and recycled. Monocytes, macrophages, mast cells, white blood cells, the, the T cells and B cells and so on. So intermittent fasting is, let me basically provide you the mechanism for why it is interesting. When we are fasting, our cells are starving. And I'm, I'm going to answer this question that what does the cell starvation mean? Is it two hours later or four hours later or 24 hours later or 48 hours later or a week? We'll discuss that in a, in a few minutes. When the cells are starving, they try to pick up material from their surroundings. Just like us, if we are starving, we'll go and try to find food and eat it. If the cell does not find food, then it starts looking inwards to say, is there anything inside that I can recycle and I can use. So here, this cell is saying to the others that, hey, cells, listen up. We have less nutrition available. Recycle whatever you can to make sure that you can survive. So for example, the intermittent fasting reduces the protein kinase A pathway. This is one of the pathways that is necessary that when it is reduced, it allows the cells to regenerate. What does that mean? Imagine a cell that is just continuously fighting. An immune cell is mostly that in that state. If you don't give it rest, it would just keep fighting and in that process keep making inflammatory molecules. On the other hand, if you give it a rest, if you ask it to hold on, it's okay, rest it can, number one, reduce the inflammatory marker production, and number two, if necessary, it can recycle itself. So when intermittent fasting is occurring, you are asking an active fighter cell to say, hold on, look inside, you are starving now, go eat things that are stuck in you, and that might actually remove things like spike proteins, or N proteins, or viral debris, and allow the cell to feel healthy and stop creating inflammation. Similarly, intermittent fasting triggers the reduction of IGF-1, which in turn helps with the aging, tumor progression, and cancers. So, a little more in detail, the mechanism. And the reason I go in details with the mechanisms is, once you understand from ground up how something works, 
then you can think about it by yourself and modulate by yourself. You don't have to go cram it or somebody doesn't have to come and tell you what to do. You can actually say, all right, here is a mechanism. I need to modulate this mechanism. So let's look at that. Inside of all of our cells, there is a protein called AMPK. There is another protein called mTOR C1. There is another protein called Beclin. These are the main partners for autophagy, but they are triggered by intermittent fasting. So here is what happens. I just need a few minutes of your focused attention at this time, then all the discussion is useful afterwards. Beclin, this protein, when active, it causes autophagy to be started. So let me repeat this. Beclin, when active, would trigger autophagy. AMPK, when active, can trigger autophagy as well. However, normally, AMPK blocks mTOR C1. Now, mTOR mTOR blocks Beclin. So if you have three people standing in a row, Beclin starts autophagy, mTOR stops Beclin. So if you want Beclin to function, what do you do? You stop the one who is stopping Beclin. So who stops Beclin? mTOR? Intermittent fasting. When the cell is starving, what does that mean? What is starving? The cell inside of it has less glucose. It has less ATP. It has less nutrition available to it. And it is also not able to get them from the environment. Now it is starving. What it does is the very first thing it does in the low nutritional state, it turns off mTOR. When the mTOR is turned off, that frees up Beclin to become active. When Beclin becomes free, then Beclin and AMPK together start the autophagy. Now, from a clinical point of view, if you are a physician, you're a nurse practitioner, you're a nurse, you're a student, think about it this way. You will find components, substances, drugs, interventions that can block mTOR. And you will be able to induce autophagy. This is what I love about science, that we know autophagy is triggered by fasting. But imagine there is someone who cannot fast because of whatever is their reason. Maybe then you can find a substance that can help do the same thing that fasting does. For example, you might find them some intervention that would help block mTOR C1. I'll give you an example. Caffeine does that. So coffee can help block mTOR C1, which would liberate Beclin, which would start autophagy. Or resveratrol does that. So there are many such substances or molecules that can help with this. Or you would find how can I have Beclin complex be more active even in the presence of mTOR? Correct? So this is how you start thinking as you know the mechanisms. So now going back here. Once the autophagy mechanism is started, this is the Nobel Prize winning research here, ATG complex or autophagy complex. It starts from autophagy genes and then autophagy proteins. They, these genes become activated. They make, first thing is they make a phagophore. This is a unique thing. A phagophore, imagine inside a cell, we build a truck for trash. Then we fill that truck with the trash. So here, when the truck is being built, what we do is we go near the trash and we start building a trash can over there. When the trash can is built, 
the trash is sitting right next to it and we just put trash in it. Beautiful mechanisms our body has. So the phagophore is formed. Phagophore is formed near the cargo. Then it envelops the cargo, brings it to lysosome. Lysosomes then help degrade it or recycle it. Good. Now, when we have the recycling done, what happens is the cells stop, immune cells especially, stop or reduce producing interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and systemic inflammation goes down. Antibody-dependent cytokine storms goes down. Why? Because the T helper 1 pathway is promoted versus T helper 2 pathway. And if you have been um, reading immunology, you would know that this is the innate arm. So let's say there is a macrophage over here. Macrophage causes T helper cell, T helper zero cell to become activated. T helper zero cell can go T helper two route, which will go B cell and B cell will then become plasma cell and they'll make antibodies. Or T helper one zero can become T helper one route and it can take cytotoxic T cells, cytotoxic T cells and so CTL or CD8 positive cells, and it would cause cell destruction through the cytotoxic pathway. Now, this pathway produces antibodies. Intermittent fasting triggers the body to go this way. That means it reduces the production of antibodies. Do you know why? Why will intermittent fasting reduce the production of antibodies? Think about it for a second. Because we are fasting, we are starving, making antibodies needs material and energy to make them. A cell that is starving, how would it make these things? So it decides that it is not my top priority to make antibodies. Instead, I can handle the problems by, excuse me, by fighter cells without making antibodies. I'll just send, send some cells over there. That is why intermittent fasting or starvation switches the body from T helper two pathway to T helper one pathway or from humoral response to cytotoxic response. Isn't this beautiful? So wrapping up this part of the discussion, intermittent fasting, when it triggers a cell for autophagy, can actually recycle, renew the inflammatory cells, help the inflammatory cells or the immune cells recycle the trash within them, help reduce the interleukin productions or inflammatory markers productions, or inflammatory system productions from them, help reduce the antibody production. So if somebody is getting sick of antibodies, for example, because of antibodies, then intermittent fasting would actually help them feel better. So this is one part, done. Now I'm going to go to the next talk here. This is, what does it mean for starvation? And how much starvation will do what to our body? So once again, why recycling is important? We make 3 million red blood cells every second. We make, I do not even know how much, 10 raised to the power 15, whatever quadrillion or whatever number of hemoglobin molecules every second. A 60 kilogram person on average makes 240 grams of proteins every day. We make them, you eat a protein meal or not, we make these proteins you're fasting or not, we have to make these proteins. Why? What are these proteins? Antibodies, liver releases proteins all the times. Every cell has secretions. Majority of them are proteins. Within the cell, there are proteins that are made to do the cellular functions. So 240 gram of proteins are made. Usually about 70 gram of those are made by the material that we eat. The remaining 170 gram are made from the recycled material from within the body. 
then if we make 240 gram of proteins we have to break down 240 grams of proteins too think about it for a second if we make new proteins every day 240 grams but we do not break down 240 grams that means we are accumulating proteins every day 240 grams in four days one kilogram if we are not breaking them down every four days we'll acquire one kilo kilograms of more proteins that's not good so what we do is we always have a balance whatever number of amount of protein you make you destroy a similar amount as well. If you destroy more and make less, then the person would start losing weight. If you make more and destroy less, then the person would start gaining weight. So our sustenance at a steady state is because makers and breakers are in balance. I discussed this before, ubiquitin, and the lytic system. So Yoshinori Osumi was the one who discovered the mechanisms and the genes of the lytic system or autophagy, and he was given the Nobel Prize. Now, question. This is probably the most contested discussion out there, and there are lots of studies about it. The discussion is when will autophagy start in a cell? So you as practitioners, my request to you is to think in two ways. It is not necessary always to have intermittent fasting. You could have substances that can help trigger autophagy, like caffeines or resveratrols and stuff like that. Dandelion leaves extracts. On the other hand, this is also important to know the time frames. So here, most common and prevalent studies show that in animal models, when a mouse or a set of mice are given only water for 24 hours, then in their cells, the phagophores and phagosome formation occurs. Remember when I discussed the phagophore, that little truck that we build near the trash, I said this is a very important point. The reason is phagophore is a double membraned vesicle. Imagine <laughs> we make a trash can which is always double layered versus we make a trash can that is a single layered trash can. Phagophores are always double layered because they're always bilayered phospholipids we can detect them and we can separate them from other vesicles within a cell because the remaining vesicles are single layered. So scientists can actually see when autophagy has started. So they say, they see in the mice models, 24 hours after fasting, eating nothing but just water or other fluids, phagophore formations start then those formations peak at 48 hours. Then they would sustain depending upon how is the state of the food intake. So this is the most common set of studies that you would see that would confirm 24 hours to 48 hours. Now asking a human being to just go 48 hours without food who doesn't have that experience is a tough thing. So when you're working with your patients or when you as a person who wants to do it, don't go for 24 hours or 48 hours immediately. First, get your feet wet to understand how to do it. But I have actually a better um, concept here. This is more recent research. This is by Dr. Anna Maria Curvo, MD and PhD. And um, Sean and Angel, it might actually be great to invite her to your talks. Her team's latest research is and I love this research. If we are doing intermittent fasting with eight hours gap between the two meals and then 16 hour gap from the second meal to the next meal, so eight, 16 structure of the intermittent fasting, then 
two types of lytic in, uh, autophagy starts. In the eight hours, macro autophagy starts. And in the 16 hours, micro autophagy starts. Of course, you will say, all right, tell us what is macro and what is micro. I'm sure that you know already, but to be on the same page, macro autophagy and micro autophagy is something that we should understand. So I'm going to explain that in a second. But this is much better than 24 hours and 48 hours of fasting. So before I explain how these mechanisms work and what is the time frame when they start working, one more clinical point. If your patient or you are going to decide to do intermittent fasting to trigger autophagy, the 16 hour gap should contain your sleep as well. Why? Again, this is a very delicate point. This is noteworthy. This is writing somewhere and keeping it in front of you. Our brain performs autophagy when we are sleeping. And this is a rule in our body. If a cell is active, it will not stop to do autophagy. For example, let's say you clean your car every once in a while. However, you would not clean your car when you are driving it as well. You won't have the car going on a highway and say, you know what, let it go and I'm going to start driving or start cleaning the car. That won't happen. You have to stop and have the car at rest. Then you start cleaning it up. Brain cells during our daily activity, wakeful time, are active. And there is the ascending reticular activating system that is telling every brain cell that, hey, we are working, stay active. There's a tone that is maintained in the brain. When that tone is maintained, when that activity status is maintained, the neurons do not perform autophagy. So it is necessary for our neurons to close their, active, their kitchen before they can do the cleaning. And their kitchen closes when we are sleeping. So that means it is important that we have microautophagy, which is more important and crucial, to be triggered during the time we are sleeping so that the neurons are also regenerated and reco recovered and refreshed. And I had done this discussion before. Sean is here from neurology. <clears throat> In our brain, there are neurons that are regenerated. So if you do neurogenesis, if you just Google it, you'll come across many mechanisms. For example, hippocampus, which is very important structure for the memory and, and retention of memory and then connection of the memory's latest events to the limbic system. Hippocampus is also connected with the remaining brain tissue as well for activation through the limbic system's activity. Hippocampus has 700 new neurons built every day, which also means 700 neurons are recycled every day. And since the discovery of hippocampal neurogenesis, there has been a lot of research on other parts of the brain where neurogenesis occurs. So there was a concept that neurons can never regenerate. Now we are seeing that in the brain, there are many parts where the neurons are regenerating. So the whole neuron recycling or within the new neuron, the protein recycle that still needs us to be resting and in a sleepful state. So there are other ways that autophagy can be triggered, but I'm going to leave that, that we're talking intermittent fasting and autophagy. So let's go here. This is the types of autophagy that occurs with the intermittent fasting structure, eight hours, 16 hours formula. Of course, if you make it four hours and 20 hours, even better, or six hours and 18 hours, even better. But eight hour and 16 hours, this is uh, Dr. Anna Maria's work and her teams. During the eight hour, 
in about a couple of hours, our body would have taken up all the glucose and ingredients that have arrived and has eaten it up. So we are now getting into a starvation state. However, not really truly starving right away. Our starvation actually starts, actual starvation starts at 14 to 16 hours. Why? Because within the liver, the glycogen stores, which are glucose stores, have also been depleted by 14 to 16 hours. So real starvation starts at that time. However, two, three hours after you have had a meal, the macro autophagy does start. So to an extent, our cells feel the hunger. And what is macro autophagy? In the macrotophagy here in this diagram, we make the phagophores as we discussed before. And you know that Becklin has to be active and mTOR has to be suppressed and AMPK has to be active, correct? For these genes to become active, that happens with the intermittent fasting, the phago phagophore starts forming. It forms near the trash, it ends up keeping the trash in it. It is also possible that the cell is trying to pick up things from outside, which is called phagocytosis or endocytosis. So an endosome may be formed that can also merge with the phagosome. Eventually, what we are saying is there is a truck which is newly built for trash and that truck may actually get more trucks coming and unloading their stuff in this truck as well. Eventually, this phagosome forms. This is happening within two, three, four hours of a meal. Then these phagosomes fuse with lysosome, as I mentioned before, and then these proteins or material are recycled. This is called one type of ma macro autophagy. Another mechanism of autophagy that triggers within eight to six, eight window, eight hour window is micro autophagy. And I have been seeing it wrong in the big macro autophagy, micro autophagy, and then chaperone mediated autophagy or CMA that occurs in the 16 hours. So I've been calling it micro, my apologies. Micro and macro both are in within the eight window. What is micro autophagy? It's actually funny. Imagine this is a lysosome. What is a lysosome? Imagine that little Pac-Man Pac uh, game we used to play that there was little quack, quack, quack Pac-Man that would go and pick up things. Imagine this is that lysosome. That lysosome was here as well. But instead of lysosome combining with the phagosome to make phagolysosome or autolysosome, the lysosome directly attaches to cellular structures to digest them. It does not need a phagosome. It doesn't need a truck. It just goes directly, starts biting the walls and start eating them away. Just like little mice can bite away at the, munch away at the walls and things. It does not need a phagosome. It does not need a truck to be filled and brought to it. This is called microautophagy. In the microautophagy, the lysosomes can directly attack Golgi operatuses or endoplasmic reticulums or the ribosomes or other structures present in the cell and start making them lean. This is what cell is doing when it is hungry. It is eating away things from itself. If it keeps doing that, we'll die. So that is why we cannot fast forever. But if you let it do that for some time, it would keep the structures lean, which is excellent. We being lean is great as well. Cell being lean is great too. Now, the next one, within the 16 hours, it is called CMA or Chepron mediated autophagy. In the Chepron, and Chepron mediated autophagy is the most efficient one. And this is what we want during the sleep as well, so that neurons are cleaned as well. In the Chepron mediated autophagy, what happens is imagine this little blue thing is a trash vesicle, it is filled with trash. Then what happens is we have special proteins in the cell called heat shock proteins. The physicians and NPs and PAs and nurses and medical students, they would know heat shock proteins are present inside the cells 
and they become active when a cell is under stress. Another important clinical point, you would love this point. Exercise triggers heat shock proteins, which in turn trigger autophagy. So the benefit of intermittent fasting can also be taken by exercise. And if you combine exercise and intermittent fasting, beautiful. Now the question will be, why? Why does exercise or stress causes autophagy? So first, intermittent fasting is a stress as well. Why? Because there is no nutrition. Cell thinks I'm going to die. It thinks I can never have food again. I'm, I'm just going to be dead. That is stress. So what happens is, Heat shock proteins are special proteins. They are, they're called heat shock proteins because they were first discovered when some cells were shocked with heat. And they saw these proteins becoming active in them, becoming formed in them. Remember, inside a cell, the proteins are not always present. They are formed at the time of need and then they do their function and then they're recycled. That's the topic we're discussing, actually. So heat shock proteins started getting formed when the cells were shocked with heat. That is why these name heat shock. But when you exercise, what are you doing? You are making your cells change their shape again and again. That tells the cell, oh man, there's an earthquake. I'm going to die. And I need to quickly start the heat shock proteins to protect me. So what does heat shock proteins do? This is like activating a fire brigade or a police department or some emergency service department. What do these do? Heat shock proteins assume when they are born in a cell, they know that we are made because the cell was under stress. That also means there is going to be a lot of trash present. That also means a cell would need to produce energy and more nutrients. Heat shock protein's job is not to go find food from outside. Their job is to help the cell from within. So what do they do? They start going and connecting with Proteins within the cell, spike protein, N protein, other proteins that are useful for cell but are not useful in hunger. So if somebody is hungry, you give them $10 for food instead of $10 for buying a shirt. So heat shock proteins know that, hey, if a shirt is lying around here, that is not needed when we are hungry. I should take up this shirt and break it down and recycle it to make food. So they pick up these proteins, bring them to a special kind of lysosome, special kind of lysosome, which has a special door in them called LAMP2A. This door, imagine Starbucks get a delivery every night. So there is a truck that comes and docks there or a Target store or a Staples store. There are trucks that come in at night and they dock with their docking sites and they unload the material from their truck. The proteins that are brought here, the trash that are brought here to the lysosome by the chaperons, that trash cannot just willy-nilly enter the lysosome and get recycled. Lysosomes are phospholipid membranes, they will not allow, allow things to just get in. Imagine they are plastic covered systems. So how do we allow these chaperone mediated things to get in? We have lamp to air doors that have a special privilege to attach with the chaperone proteins and take their cargo and move it in. So once that cargo is brought in, then it is recycled. This is called chaperone mediated autophagy. Imagine as if the emergency responders are activated to go around the whole city, pick up trash and waste material, or even that material that is usually needed by the city, but at this time not because city is in a state of hunger and bring them all in, break them down and make nutritions. This is what activates in 16 hours and not in eight hours. 
So exactly when? About 14 to 16th hour is when CMA activates. So that means if you're in the window of 16 hours, you could expect that in the last couple of hours, CM, CMA is working. That is the time with the maximal benefit for neurons, maximal be benefit for immune system, maximal benefit for the liver cells, for all cells that need to clean up their house. So, eight hour window, macro and micro autophagy, which is also important, and then autophagy on steroids. 16 hour window, and in that window, last two, three hours. That means if we snack during the eight hours, or if we snack during the 16 hours, we would actually destroy the triggering of autophagy and we would destroy the benefit of intermittent fasting, even if it is a tiny bit of chips or whatever. As soon as the body has some nutrients from environment, these all the internal mechanism will go to sleep and say, you know what? Oh, we got something from outside. Actually, if you snack during the 16 hours, then this little poor chaperone protein itself will be recycled that, hey, you're not needed anymore. Go away. So that is it. That's a discussion. One last piece for completion's sake. The ubiquitin mechanism. Remember I said there are two mechanisms to recycle cells and the cell proteins. Ubiquitin mechanism works in this way. In our cells, we have a structure called endosomes. And all of us medical guys have guys and gals. We studied them. Endosomes are little tiny shredders. You put proteins in them and they would recycle them and take the amino acids out of them. When we decide that a protein is not needed anymore, just like, for example, if you snack during the intermittent fasting and during the intermittent fasting, chaperones were created to bring the material over. Now you snacked. This chaperon is now tagged to say, you need to go away. We don't need you. So how would we not need them? We'll tag them with ubiquitin. Whichever protein is tagged by ubiquitin, that protein will be brought to endosome. Endosome would break down that protein and make that into smaller amino acids. This is the ubiquitin mechanism. Ubiquitin mechanism does not break down everything it finds. Lytic mechanism breaks down whatever it finds in multiple ways. So this is the basic discussion. Now, some interesting thoughts to care for. On one end, for diabetics, we say that please be careful with the intermittent fasting because they can actually become unconscious if the glucose level falls too much. However, diabetics actually can benefit from intermittent fasting to the point of actually edging to the reversal of diabetes, especially type 2. So you as a physician, as a provider, have to think about what is the state of a person who is diabetic? Are they overweight and can they use the benefit of intermittent fasting or are they already too lean? So once you know the pathogenesis of diabetes, if you think they can do intermittent fasting, then intermittent fasting, especially with ketotic type food structure or less carbs, or even if there are carbs, eight hour window and 16 hour window, that would help tremendously. Secondly, pregnant women should not do intermittent fasting because that would reduce the production or provision of the nutrition from their body to the baby's body, the developing baby. So the, the woman's body become selfish and say, you know what, I am hungry, so I'm going to just keep it for myself, whatever food comes in, and baby will be given less. So baby's development needs are such that we cannot do intermittent fasting. Although I have seen pregnant women fast, but this is a care to have. Similarly, breastfeeding mothers 
should also be careful because it can reduce the nutritional value or even the volume of the, the milk that is produced. Intermittent fasting also has to be carefully done in cancer patients. The reason is, on one end, intermittent fasting actually helps a cancer patient by recycling the immune system cells. On the other end, intermittent fasting has been observed to actually allow the cancer cells to become, start growing more unchecked because the immune cells are recycling. So a balance has to be struck there. And finally, intermittent fasting is tremendously interesting for long COVID and vaccine injured. I have seen so many patients reporting, <coughs> excuse me, reporting that I was feeling bad and started fasting and now I'm feeling great. One of the examples from my own family member, uh, 23, 24 years old uh, young woman, became vaccine injured, had horrible neurological symptoms. And then one, one day she calls me and she says, you know what, I have started fasting and it helps me so much. When I'm fasting, I'm feeling better. And so that allowed her to start having those little tiny steps that when she's fasting, she's feeling better, then she can think clearly what to do next. But if one is continuously stuck with the vaccine injury or long COVID, then for them to think clear becomes a problem because they just continuously in a psychological and physical state of trauma. So these are some of the things to consider. I would consider always to start the intermittent fasting with 8, 16. That is the easiest. We are actually used to having meals within eight hours. The only thing is middle meal or lunch and snacks will have to be skipped. And then if necessary, eight hour window can reduce further to give more time for CMA, which is chaperone-mediated um, intermittent fasting. So that is the discussion. Thank you so much for, um, for listening to this. I hope it was somewhat coherent and valuable. It was fabulous. Thank you so much, Dr. Bean. That was, that was wonderful. Uh, a couple of questions. I'm going to, let's see. Um, Elise says, uh, rephrase, can you exercise while starting your fast to decrease time to chaperone mediated uh, autophagy? Yes, yes. Okay. Caloric restriction, exercising, caffeine intake, these can all, resveratrol intake, um, the dandelion leaf extract, they all can further accelerate the activation of these uh, mechanisms. Um, there's another question, but you already answered that, um, which would be contraindicated diabetics maybe, and you said take into consideration the, the pathophysiology of your diabetic patient. Correct. So ideally, intermittent fasting is very good for a diabetic, and it can bring them towards reversal. However, they have to start from a place of what is the reason for diabetes, and what is their body habitus? And then, for example, if somebody has an um, inflammation of cancer or infection of cancer, and they are becoming diabetic because of that, and on top of that, we say you start doing intermittent fasting, that can be a problem because it can, the pancreas itself is in trauma. It, similarly, if somebody is stressed, and because of that stress, they have the stress hormones like adrenaline and glucagon, which are active, then intermittent fasting would not really help that much because the stress hormones are going to try to resist it. So first we need to then look at why is somebody stressed and see if we can reduce the stress then to combine with intermittent fasting. Okay, uh, next question. Any idea how long fasting would take to clear spike protein? Sorry? Any idea how long fasting would take to clear the spike protein? So there is no study yet that measures the time. 
So that means this will have to be a personal experience to say, let me start the intermittent fasting. Let me see how do I feel better. And if I continue how long, eventually it will be cleared. I've seen that this spike with help clears within six, seven, eight months. Without help, it keeps on going for years. And <coughs> my apologies for this cough. And we know React 19 is actually, it has a lot of people with the vaccine injury as well. So we see that in some cases, it just continues for a long time. So short answer is we don't actually have a data-driven answer to this question. And there was another question. I just want to quickly respond to that. Spermidine. Spermidine is great as well for triggering autophagy. Okay, very good. Um, Denise is also asking, uh, how does intermittent fasting help in Parkinson's? So very interesting. There are studies that show that it helps. The exact mechanism is not there yet. So I'm going to give you my, my conjecture, my opinion. That means I can totally be wrong. And that is intermittent fasting causes neurogenesis. Now, neurogenesis is actually caused by anything that is that is, I don't want to say shocking, that is amazing to our brain. Anything. For example, my lights right now must have caused neurogenesis in some people who must have said, oh, look at his lights. If you use a particular path or roads or, or directions for your office and home commute, if you change it one day and the, the scenery is new, that causes uh, neurogenesis. Now, going back to the intermittent fasting and the Parkinsonism, I believe that as intermittent fasting would trigger autophagy in hippocampus and in the other areas which include ascending reticular activation systems, then that is possibility that that causes the remaining brain cells to become number one active and number two cleaned up as well. But exact mechanism is not, at least I'm not familiar with it. Okay, very good. Um, someone was asking uh, intake of resveratrol. Is it a supplement uh, in a specific food? Um, and thank you for a wonderful presentation. I could go grab my bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe I don't drink. So this is something that is just my knowledge that red wine has resveratrol. And secondly, resveratrol is available. For example, you can get it from Amazon too. And in the same way, hydroxychloroquine or any other drug that reduces the acidity in our body, especially vesicles, hydroxy's function is driven by reducing acidity in our cells' vesicles, including lysosomes. That means hydroxy, by the nature of its mechanism, reduces autophagy's impact. It doesn't block the triggering of autophagy, but imagine we fill a trash can and bring it to a shredder to say, please shred this, but the shredder is working at half speed. So the performance of autophagy is less and hydroxy does reduce that. That means if you're taking hydroxy, let's say for um, COVID or long COVID, that may actually be reducing the effect of intermittent fasting or autophagy. Similarly, other drugs that would reduce the acidity in our body intentionally would also interfere with autophagy and the results of intermittent fasting. Um, and Brianne is asking any thoughts on supplementation of nitric oxide and potential benefits of inflammatory. So nitric oxide is great for anti-inflammation because of the other reasons. One, of course, it helps make the antioxidants. Secondly, it helps improve the blood vessels activity because it is a vasodilator. So it has other ways to help. I haven't seen its function in the autophagy. Um, can compounded metformin and acrine assist with autophagy? Compounded metformin and autophagy. So 
there was a research that Dr. Paul Merrick and I discussed, I believe if I remember it correctly, that metformin also helps with autophagy. However, I have not seen the study. So it is bad on me that I've not seen the study. That doesn't mean it doesn't do it or do it. I am just not aware of it. Okay, final question from our friend Tim. Is it possible that the cachexia common to late stage cancer, even the vax injured is a healing attempt by the homeostatic system? That's actually a good question. I wanna read it once more. I saw, saw it here. Um, can you please um, repeat that? I saw that it was a good question. Is it uh, possible that the cachexia common to late stage cancer or even the vax injured is a healing attempt by the homeostatic system. Absolutely. Cachexia is actually, there are two reasons for that. One is that the cancer cells are just picking up nutrition and are taking it away. The other, and cancer cells are then releasing molecules that are suppressing the remaining system to take up the uh, nutrients. So the remaining system would actually do autophagy. And that is why we start becoming lean because our autophagy is now eating away our healthy cells. The only problem is that you can think of the outside of the cancer cells, the remaining tissue as in a continuous state of intermittent fasting. So not even intermittent, continuous state of fasting, which then causes harm. So in such situations, reducing, if somebody is actually becoming cachexic, then it is interesting to reduce intermittent uh, autophagy instead of promoting it further. Very interesting. Um, I'm going to show, this is my resveratrol um, that I use. Excellent. Oh, there's the, yeah, that's the, that's what I use. Um, last question and we're gonna wrap because we're a little bit late and this was just a really awesome lecture. Uh, is there any evidence that the spike protein can cause mutation of mitochondrial DNA? There is no such evidence. However, this has been studied again and again that spike protein's presence causes mitochondrial dysfunction. And intermittent fasting actually combats that behavior by trying to remove the spike protein and other inflammatory proteins that are formed within the cell by recycling them. It takes away the weapon from the spike protein and starts mitochondria on the healing. If we combine intermittent fasting or autophagy inducers with melatonin. Melatonin is more specifically targeted towards helping uh, um, mitochondria restore and start doing uh, respiration again. That will be a very powerful combination. Awesome. All right. Okay, guys. I think that's about it for this evening. And thank you so much again. I know I keep saying thank you, but I do appreciate your time I'm and your knowledge welcome. and wisdom and, and all that good stuff. So uh, I, I'm honored to have you here this evening. You're so. very welcome. It was my privilege to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to let you guys know next week, um, we, we're going to sneak Dr. J.P. Salivi in. He is going to discuss an uh, alternative to the um, medicine, you know, the mainstream medicine that uh, we, most of us have been practicing. Um, he has a, a little solution to that that's been working for him and has been in practice and um, he's doing well with it. And he's gonna share that uh, program with us. And then after that, we're gonna start on every other Tuesday um, rather than our every other Thursday. And it's gonna be with um, attorney Tom Renz and uh, former assistant attorney general from um, Colorado, uh, Maureen West. And that's gonna be on Tuesday, 920. And then October is up and coming and we're booking up. And um, again, thank you everyone for being here with us. And uh, God bless, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.